Again, we invite you to listen to our Bible study, and it's our prayer that you will know the true God of the Bible that gives true salvation. Today, we will study about the fourth commandment of God in the Holy Bible, keep the Holy Sabbath. And as you listen, may you find the true rest that comes from Jesus Christ. Sabbath day, keep it holy. This is the fourth commandment of God. We can find that in Exodus chapter 20 verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. And in verse 9, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Question. To which day does God refer? Is it Saturday the seventh or Sunday the first day of the week? Actually, it is Saturday being the seventh day. How come majority of Christians observe Sunday? This came about quoting from Wikipedia and I quote the Roman calendar included the day of the sun or Latin dies solis, for worship of the sun, sol invictus. On March 7, 321 AD, Constantine I, also known as Constantine the Great, Rome's first Christian emperor, decreed that Sunday, or dies solis, will be observed as the Roman day of rest. Since Catholicism, considered to be the mother of Christian sects, started in Rome, therefore almost all denominations, except some few, Observe Sunday as the day of rest. These are the verses in support for Sunday instead of Saturday. Jesus Christ resurrected on Sunday, the first day of the week. We can find that in John chapter 20 verse 1. And I quote, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taketh away from the sepulcher. Also, Paul preached on Sunday in Acts chapter 20 verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. What is God's punishment for violating the Sabbath rest? Very clearly stated by demonstration, the answer is death penalty. We can find that in Numbers chapter 15 verse 32. And I quote, the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all that congregation. And in verse 35, And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. Moses implemented the command of God in verse 36 of Numbers 15. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. If violation to this commandment is so abominable to God that justifies death as penalty, why don't we see its harsh enforcement today? This is what we hear from preachers. God in the Old Testament is very strict, but when Jesus Christ came, He preached love and mercy. Question. But Jesus Christ emphatically stated in Matthew 5.17, He said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. If so, how did Jesus Christ fulfill this law on Sabbath? The answer usually heard from preachers is that with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, hatred is changed with compassion. Therefore, the death penalty for violation of the law on Sabbath no longer applies. However, violating it whether Saturday or Sunday is still a sin, and this is easily forgiven as written in 1 John 1 9. And I quote, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Question again What basis did the Jews? have been condemning Jesus Christ in violating this law. On several occasions, Jesus healed the sick on the Sabbath day. The man born blind in John 9:37 to 41, the lame, dumb, maimed, and many others. He healed them all on Sabbath. 
Matthew chapter 15 verse 30. Can you cite other instances when Jesus was accused of violating this law? In this occasion, Jesus healed a woman from her infirmity, bothering her for 18 years in Luke chapter 13. Let us read beginning in verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise leap up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, Because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them, therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And also, Christ's disciples picked corn in the field to eat in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were on hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And in verse 2, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. How do religious leaders today think of the Jews crucifying Jesus Christ on the cross for violating Sabbath? Of course, very clear to them, Jesus Christ did not violate the law. Therefore, they go along with our Lord rebuking the scribes and Pharisees calling them hypocrites and blind leaders of the blind. How did Jesus justify his acts that he was not violating the Sabbath law? Jesus gave enlightening parables, but the religious leaders during his time, and sadly to say also our preachers today, have not understood his intended message thereof. Example, for healing on the Sabbath, here is Jesus' first parable. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 11, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one ship, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? Will he not lay hold on it and leap it out? In verse 12, How much then is a man better than a ship? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. For delivering the woman from infirmity for 18 years, here is our Lord's parable rebuking the head of the synagogue and those people around him. In Luke chapter 13, verse 15, I quote, The Lord said, Thou hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And for Jesus justifying the acts of his disciples speaking corn in the field to it, in Matthew chapter 12, he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered and they that were with him? In verse 4, How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shewbread and was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. What significance do we hear from preachers today regarding these parables? To them, very clearly, Jesus Christ was emphasizing the urgency of his acts that he had performed when even on the Sabbath day. Is not that really the intended message for the parables? Let us remember, Jesus Christ did not speak except in parables, and he expounds this only to his disciples. Therefore, this must be hidden from the outsiders who do not truly recognize him. How does he reveal his intended message to his disciples or the chosen? Let us remember, it is written everything needed, for this is already given in the Holy Bible. When we open our Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, we can find, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, and we may do all the, word, the words of this law. What is secret and therefore hidden are those that are not written. Example, in Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered, their voices I was about to write, 
And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Can you demonstrate how God reveals the intended message for each of the three parables, proving Jesus Christ did not violate the Sabbath law? Let us remember Jesus Christ is actually the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in his primary role as the Father in the flesh. Therefore, he gives everything in the Bible that his chosen need for the revelation of his words. What then does sheep symbolize in the parable that fell into a pit? Jesus Christ called his disciples sheep in the following in John chapter 10 verse 3. I quote, My sheep hear my voice and call it my own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And in verse 4, And when I put it forth my own sheep, I goeth before them, and the sheep follow me, for they know my voice. Very clearly in the parable of the sheep refers to the chosen of God that needs to be rescued from death or eternal damnation. In that parable, what does pit symbolize? In the book of Psalms, David spoke of pit. Let us listen. In Psalm 30 verse 3, O Lord, Thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Clearly, therefore, pit is the place for the damned or the unsaved. Just for those two words, does not our Lord reveal the intended message for Sabbath? You get it. Sabbath actually is the message of God for salvation. Our discussion is getting very interesting. Now, what does ox symbolize in the parable that needs watering or thirsty of water? Ox or cattle is an animal that is cloven footed and chews the cud, like sheep. The ox is considered clean in Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 4. Before receiving divine revelation, Simon Peter took the letter of the word for clean and unclean animals. However, in Acts chapter 10, in a vision, God revealed to him that clean and unclean animals symbolize people. This was demonstrated when Peter was not supposed to meet and speak to Cornelius, a non-Jew being an Italian. However, God directed Peter to meet him since Cornelius was made clean already. What then is the significance of Peter needing to meet Cornelius as symbolized by an ox? Just as an ox needs watering or thirsty of water, Cornelius has to hear the word of God symbolized by water in the following. First reference for water for the letter of the word in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Another reference for water, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, 38-39. How about an ass in the parable that, like the ox, also needs watering or thirsty of water? Let us remember when Jesus Christ went to Jerusalem, he rode on an ass or a lowly donkey and was met by many people. In Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 5, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a coat the foal of an ass. Can we imagine Jesus Christ riding on a lowly ass or donkey? He did not ride on a majestic horse as worldly kings do. A horse is considered unclean. Question. How do you relate now the woman suffering from infirmity for 18 years with the ass or donkey? Since Jesus Christ glorified as poor ass or donkey by riding on it, for the woman suffering from infirmity, it is obvious that she deserves the care or concern of our Lord being a chosen one. What can you now say about the Sabbath law as the fourth commandment of God? As it is written, 
In Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, I quote, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. This was on the sixth day. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, do we understand what Jesus Christ told the Jews regarding Sabbath? It is not how people think about it, but actually it is how God cherishes it. For the vastness and enormity of His work in preparing the chosen to be with Him in eternity. Mark chapter 2 verse 27, And He said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. What a great spiritual blunder for religious leaders to accuse him not of serving Sabbath. That is why he told them in Matthew chapter 12 verse 8, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What is the conclusion for this very mystifying commandment of God? God's revelation may appear foolish to the natural man, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 2.14. I quote, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. However, with the foregoing revelations of God regarding the sacredness of Sabbath that actually relates to salvation, undoubtedly the man gathering sticks is equivalent to the following. Number 1. Esau, who with bread and cup of soup traded his birthright in Genesis chapter 25. And in remorse, he cried for losing his salvation. Hebrews 12.17 Second, King Saul, a chosen of God, blinded by envy with David, offered things that God commanded him to kill. He ended his own life, as written in 1 Samuel, Samuel 31.4-5. Third, Judas Iscariot, who sold Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, and at the Last Supper, in pride, he dipped his hand in the dish of our Lord. He took his own life in Matthew 26.23 as King Saul did. And so, Sabbath as an eternal sign to the chosen, God told Moses in Exodus 31 verse 13, I quote, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that do sanctify you. And finally, as chosen of God, how do we keep the Sabbath holy as God commands us? For six days, this represents our life as chosen of God that many people do not see. Jesus in his role as son knows how tedious and tiresome this work of humbling ourselves before his father is. Humbling ourselves means crucifying our self-will every day every minute, every second, and allow the will of God to be done instead. This is not easy. This is heavy and tiresome. That's why Christ is inviting us to learn from Him and He will exchange His rest in our heaviness. And so, He invites us and conveys this through Matthew, one of His apostles, in chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest or Sabbath. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest or Sabbath unto your souls. And lastly, in verse 30, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Sabbath, or the seventh day, therefore, God requires us to keep it holy, and this is revealed to Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. Again, this may be foolishness to the natural man. However, long ago in the Old Testament, David showed how he kept the Sabbath holy and wrote it in his psalm, chapter 30, verse 12. I quote, My glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. And also in Psalms 45, verse 17. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, shall I praise thee forever and ever. Psalm 150 verse 2 Praise God for his mighty acts, 
praised Him according to His excellent greatness. I would like to thank you all for listening to this broadcast. Our prayer is that God shine His face on you all, to all of you, as He reveals Himself to you, will open your spiritual ears and hear what the Spirit is saying.